Hello Chemistry, Mr. Sucker here again. And today in this video lesson we're going to look at methods for balancing chemical equations. You've already done a little bit of work introducing or, or reintroducing the idea of the chemical equations. It's a shorthand notation for taking a full sentence and expressing it in a shorthand notation. And chemists love shorthand notations because we're inherently lazy, I mean efficient. And so the chemical equation shows reactants on one side, products on the other, and it gives us an idea of what our starting point is and what our ending point is. And I've said before that it's very similar to cooking, and it's the weekend when I'm filming this, and so this morning I decided to make waffles, and I made waffles, you know, you can make waffles from scratch, it includes ingredients like uh, flour and baking powder, which is essentially baking soda with a couple of other things mixed in, and sugar. Uh, I buy, I use a box mix because I'm a chemist and chemists are inherently lazy, I mean efficient, and my cooking goes that way as well. Uh, so we use the box mix, and you can see here a picture of the batter and one of the waffles coming out of the waffle maker, and it works out. You use the right amount of uh, mix, you use the right amount of eggs, you use the right amount of milk, and you cook it at the right temperature and you get a waffle. Uh, just for fun, I decided to see what would happen if I use the wrong combination of ingredients. And so I made this other batter, which looks very similar to the waffle batter. It contained flour, it contained baking soda, it contained milk. Um, but when I mixed it up and I made a waffle, it even made something that sort of looked like a waffle. But uh, oddly enough, it smelled like a pretzel, and sure enough, I looked up online that uh, some no-yeast pretzel recipes are flour and milk and baking soda or baking powder and some salt, and so I even, actually, I even tasted a little bit of it, and it sort of tasted like a pretzel in a very weird kind of way. So when you make a recipe, you need the right ingredients, and you need the right amounts of both ingredients. And when we look in a chemical equation, essentially what we're writing is the recipe for a specific chemical reaction. So we need specific substances to be brought together under the right conditions to produce a specific product, and the amounts must match up. If you have too many reactants or you don't have the right ratio of reactants, you're going to produce some product, but you're also going to end up with leftovers or impurities, and that's not what we want. It's not very mathematically sound to do that. So the chemical equation shows the true ratio between each and every substance. And as we've discussed before, the ratios are in units of moles. One mole is 6 times 10 to the 23rd particles, a little bit over that. Uh, this was a number credited to Avogadro, so it's called Avogadro's number. But in a reaction, what happens is you know, one particle will react with one particle. So one atom goes with one atom, or one atom goes with two atoms. And in order to mathematically quantify a reaction, you theoretically need to count individual atoms and molecules. Well, we can't do that. So we use this idea of the mole. Uh, we've worked before with molar masses. They relate to the average atomic masses on the periodic table. So you can, you know, water has a molar mass of around 18 because it's made of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, and their molar masses add up to around 18. So that 18 grams of water represents one mole. So 18 grams of water is going to be 6 times 10 to the 23rd particles of water. I don't cho choose to do a lot with counting particles because the mole is so much more convenient. And in a chemical equation, we express the number of moles needed of each substance by the molar coefficients. So if you know the molar coefficients and you need so many grams of something, you can just do a little bit of calculations with the molar mass and find out what you actually need to put on the scale in the lab to produce a particular reaction. So once you know your recipe, once you know the ingredients that you want to put together and the product that you're trying to produce, the trick then is to know exactly how much of each ingredient you need for the product to come out right. And that process for chemical equations is called balancing the equation. Equations need to be balanced uh, due to the law of conservation of matter. It basically says matter cannot be created or destroyed. Therefore, 
we need every single atom of reactant to be present in the products. The atoms can rearrange themselves, they can form new substances, but the individual atoms need to be accounted for. So because the subscripts define the substance, the, subs the subscripts really are controlled by the electron structures, we don't want to make the electrons mad. We can't change the subscripts just for the sake of balancing. That would be like substituting salt for sugar in a recipe, and that would not be very good. So we cannot change the subscripts to balance an equation. We can only change the coefficients. And so there are a couple of different methods that can be used to balance the coefficients of an equation, and I'm going to show you both of those methods with some examples. The first method for balancing a chemical equation is called the inspection method or trial and error. It's well suited for simple equations or sometimes the second method, which is called the algebraic method, uh, will run into a paradox, meaning you'll end up with a dead end trying to solve it with that method. Most students tell me that they like the algebraic method better, and particularly those students who've studied outside the United States, sometimes that's the only way that it's taught. Um, but, you know, I actually learned the trial and error method, and it was a student at one point that pointed out to me the algebraic method. So I teach both. You can always use either method. I'm not going to tell you that you have to use one method over the other. It's good to know both met methods from a strategic point of view, but um, you know, in most cases, either one will work. I'm going to start with an example that is a very simple one, and many of you can look at the this equation and probably balance it in your head without using any method. But I'm going to show you the trial and error method on a simple one. We'll go up to a couple of harder ones, and then I'll show you the algebraic method for some other examples. So the first step in the trial and error method is to draw a line right under the arrow. And that is strictly for uh, visual reference to separate the reactants from the products. So you put it right under the arrow. And then you're going to list the elements that are in the reactants. And then list the elements that are in the products. Hopefully those two lists are the same. If uh, your elements are different on one side of the arrow than the other, you have bigger problems than just trying to balance it. Then you're going to count the number of atoms of each element on each side of the equation. And the terminology is very important. You know, when I talk about atoms or substances or compounds or molecules, it's very specific what I'm talking about. And remember that balancing the equation focuses on making sure the numbers of atoms on each side of the equation are the same. So I have one sodium atom. So this will essentially be you know, showing one mole of sodium atoms over here. And then uh, two chlorine atoms. So there's a subscript here. The subscripts are multipliers. So this is one of our diatomic gases from Han F. Brickell. So it's a molecule with two chlorine atoms. So notice I'm counting atoms. Over here we have sodium chloride, which contains one sodium and one chlorine per formula group. So the equation's not balanced. I have two chlorine atoms here, one over here. I can't change the subscript because the electrons tell me that chlorine's going to be diatomic. So I have to add in molar coefficients. So draw the line, count the elements, and the next step is to add a multiplier that will help you balance it out. So I don't need to do anything with sodium right now. They're balanced, but I do need more chlorine. So I say, well, here's a 1. What can I multiply by 1 to get to 2? This is like, you know, third grade math here, but we're all good. So if I multiply that by 2, it's going to balance the chlorine. But I can't do anything with just this chlorine. I can't put a subscript. I can't squeeze a number in here. This is sodium chloride. The only other thing I can do is say, well, if I need twice as much chlorine, I need twice as much sodium chloride. The obvious problem with that is that this has changed not only the amount of chlorine, but it's also changed the amount of sodium. So we solved one problem, but we kind of caused another. That happens a lot. 
uh, be patient with it. You'll cycle back through the process again. This is what we call an iterative process, meaning you, you'll uh, move through it in several individual steps before you solve the whole problem. Um, so we repeat the process. You know, we've recounted everything, and now I need to multiply sodium. If I put in a multiplier there, now I have a balanced equation, two sodiums on each side, two chlorines on each side, and that's our balanced chemical equation for the reaction of sodium metal with chlorine gas to produce sodium chloride. That's the inspection method. So I'll run through a couple of other examples and show you a couple of tricks. I won't do quite as much explaining with them so that the video can move along quicker, but I'm gonna switch this one out and go ahead and put in another example that we're familiar with and that we probably know the solution for. Uh, but we have uh, the reaction of copper with silver nitrate to produce silver and copper nitrate. Again, draw the arrow, um, list out my elements, sodium or copper, silver, nitrogen, oxygen, copper, silver, nitrogen, oxygen. I try to keep them in the same order because it makes it easy to compare. So one copper, one silver, one nitrogen, three oxygen, and where the three only multiplies by the oxygen, not the nitrogen. And I have one copper, one silver, two nitrogen. So I have a multiplier outside the parentheses. So two times nitrogen and two times three oxygen, which means six. So copper and silver are balanced, uh, the nitrate group's not. Can't change the subscript because that relates to the difference in copper and silver's oxidation states. Copper uh, two plus, silver a one plus, so they bond differently with our one minus nitrate group. So um, I'm gonna try balancing the nitrogens first because that's an easy multiplier by two. So I go to where nitrogen is, put my two, that's going to affect all of these. So I now have two silver, two nitrogen, and two times three, six oxygens. Great. I fixed the nitrate, but I changed the silver. Oh, good. That's a pretty easy balance. I can come up here, put a two, and now my equation's balanced. I'm going to show you one shortcut for this. And again, you can always do it element by element. That's foolproof. But... If you recognize that this polyatomic group does not break apart or change at all in the reaction. So we had nitrate here, we still have nitrate here, we've just taken two of them instead of one. If you can recognize that the polyatomic group is not affected, you can actually balance with the polyatomic group. So instead of going copper, silver, and nitrogen and oxygen, I can just do the nitrate group and then copper, silver, and the nitrate group. And then the balancing is pretty similar. One, 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 two. I'm going to balance the nitrate group, multiplying by two, changes the silver, and I balance the silver. So in that case, it worked out. It was... Uh, Similar balancing, just a little bit easier and that you didn't have to deal with these separately. You have to be very careful to only apply this when you have something like a single replacement reaction that the polyatomic group is the same, untouched from one side to the other, just rearranged. So that's the polyatomic group shortcut. There'll be one other shortcut here when we work with this uh, combustion reaction. So we have Butane reacting with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Draw my line down the middle. Uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Uh, do my counts. Four, ten, and two. Oxygen's another diatomic. And then carbon over here. One, two, and you got to be careful here. There are three oxygens to begin with. You have to count oxygen everywhere that it is. So I have two in carbon dioxide, one in water. 
And this immediately strikes fear into me because I see I have an odd number here and an even number here. I can't easily multiply any one number by one of these sides to balance it. You might think about how we're going to end up in a least common multiple situation, somehow getting to six or something like that. But um, there's a trick so that you don't have to worry about that. And this trick is used usually when the last thing you're trying to balance is a diatomic gas. So I'm going to leave oxygen for the end. Let's go ahead and try and balance the carbon first. So I can put a multiplier here. That balances the carbon, but now I have 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1 is 9 oxygen. So carbon's balanced. Um, hydrogen, I can multiply by 5. And so now um, I have 10 hydrogen. Good. But now I have a new number of oxygen. So don't forget your original. 8 plus 5 is... 13 oxygen. So now we're in a tough spot because 2 and 13, uh, 2 does not go into 13 by any sort of even number. By rule, in an equation, in a final equation, all coefficients need to be whole numbers. Because you look at this and you say, wow, if I can multiply that by 6 and a half, you know, 2 times 6 is 12, 2 times 7 is 14, so 2 times 6 and a half would be 13. If I can multiply that by 6 and a half, then I'd be done. But we can't have fractions in these coefficients. So there's a trick for that. Let's go ahead and multiply it by 6 and 1 half. Although remember that 6 and 1 half is the same as 13 over 2. And notice that those that happens to be these two numbers in a fraction. So 13 over 2. I'm going to put that here, which then is going to balance the oxygen. And then I can clear this fraction. And the way that you clear a fraction is you multiply by a common denominator. So if I multiply everything by 2, I'll clear this fraction. So if I multiply this times 2, I'm going to end up with 13. If I multiply one thing by 2, I have to multiply everything by 2. So this becomes 2, this becomes 8, this becomes 10. And so my final balanced equation is 2 butanes, 2 moles of butane plus 13 moles of oxygen gas will react to produce 8 moles of carbon dioxide and 10 moles of water, our balanced chemical equation. The second method for balancing chemical equations is called the algebraic method. It uh, utilizes something that you may or may not have learned in your math classes yet called solving systems of equations. Most of you should have, hopefully by this point in your math career, solved one equation for one unknown, you know, 5 equals 23x solve for x. Um, when you have two unknowns, you learn in math class that you need two equations. When you have three unknowns, you need three equations. Um, we don't have to exactly adhere by those rules. We can uh, maybe solve for five unknowns with three equations because here in chemistry, we get to cheat a little bit. So we're going to turn our chemical equation into a series of mathematical equations. And so each substance in our chemical equation is going to get its own variable letter. And you can use whatever letters you want. I usually just go A, B, C, D, E. Um, you're then going to write a mathematical equation for each element. We're still doing everything by element. And for this particular method, it's best just to stick with the elements. Don't try and do polyatomic groups for the algebraic method. And then we're going to ultimately end up with an equation for each element, and we're going to solve for the variables. And the cheat that we get to do is that we don't necessarily need one unique solution. We're just looking for ratios. So the rule in math class about you need three equations to solve for three unknowns is when you're looking for one specific unique solution to the problem. We just want to know what the ratios are, and then we can clear fractions or things out later. 
And we do that again by using that idea of uh, a common denominator. So the first step in using the algebraic method to balance an equation is to give each substance a letter. We're just, you know, making variables x, y, z, but I tend to use a, b, c, and so on. So sodium metal is substance A, chlorine gas, Cl2 is substance B, and sodium chloride is substance C. So then I list off each element, sodium, chlorine, and then I'm going to give each element an equation, but my arrow is going to become an equal sign. So for sodium, I have one sodium in A, so A, it really is one A, but we don't tend to write the ones. So A equals one C. So basically we're saying that there's the same amount of sodium in substance A as there is in substance C. For chlorine, there's two chlorines in substance B and only one chlorine in substance C. So we're saying there's twice as much chlorine in this substance as there is over here. So we have three unknowns with two equations. And in math class, you'd say, well, you can't do this because you need uh, three equations to solve for three unknowns. But we can use some other little properties. If A equals C and um, 2B equals C, then A must equal 2B doesn't necessarily get it for us. So let's just say, for example, what if, um, let's see, keep with my manual so I do this right. Um, I'm going to say, what if C equals 1? I could have said A equals 1, could have said B equals 1, but uh, I notice that if I plug in 1 for C, then I'll be able to figure out what A is, and I'll be able to figure out what B is. You could choose any number here. You could choose any letter to start with. This is strategy here. Pick a number that's going to be an easy multiplier, and pick a good letter to start with. Sometimes when you do this, you find that, uh, this isn't working out. Maybe start over, try a different letter. Uh, setting a different letter equal to 1, I mean. So if C equals 1, then we know... Uh, if C equals A, A equals, and I'm going to plug, so we can do this so you can see it, A equals C, so that equals 1. And then 2B is going to equal 1. I'm just going ahead and doing the substitution of 1 for C there. And so if I solve this, B is going to equal 1 half. So for convenience, I'll list off my letters, A equals 1, B equals 1 half, C equals 1. These numbers are my coefficients, 1, 1 half, 1. But we remember that coefficients can't be uh, fractions, so we can clear this fraction by multiplying by the denominator. So if I multiply that by 2, Excuse me, if I multiply that by 2, that becomes 1. But if I multiply one thing by 2 times 2, if I multiply one thing by 2, I have to multiply everything by 2. So my coefficients, I take the number with A, I put it on substance A. I take the number for B, I put it on substance B, but we don't write the 1 because we're going to be efficient. And then uh, I take the number for C, I put it there, and you should find that we got the exact same equation that we did using the inspection method. This maybe was a little bit overkill for this particular equation, but the methodology gets us to the same answer in just a little bit more of a complicated manner. Let's take a look at a different example, however, and see if maybe that one uh, doesn't flow a little bit better, seem a little bit more useful in terms of using the algebraic method. So I will switch over to another example. Uh, let's see, let's go ahead and do, this is a little thermite kind of stuff, uh, the reaction of uh, aluminum oxide with iron to produce an iron oxide. 
It's not one of the iron oxides you're used to seeing. Um, this one is iron in a pretty high oxidation state. And um, so you get this Fe304 and then aluminum metal. And balancing this, you can see how we'd end up, we got a three and a four and a, and a three and a two. And wow, this seems like the inspection method would be pretty challenging. So let's label our substances. A, B, C, D. Scooch that down just a little bit. There we go. Um, so our elements are aluminum and oxygen and iron. So, wow, we're going to have four unknowns and uh, three equations, but we can do it. So, aluminum, there's two aluminum in A, and then one aluminum in D. For oxygen, there's three oxygen in A, none in B. For C, none in D. And for iron, there's uh, one in B. And again, I could write the one, but I'm choosing not to because it's understood. So iron, 1B, and 3C. Uh, usually, I kind of default to, let's just make A equal to 1. So if A is 1, then D equals 2A, which equals 2. So... I'm substituting in 1 for A, uh, so 2 times 1 is 2. If I know A equals 1, then I know that 4C, pencil is not cooperating, 4C is uh, 3A, so that's 3 times 1, so 4C equals 3, so C is going to equal 3 over 4. So I've got A, I've got D, I have C. And then B is going to be, now I have this value that I can substitute in. So B is going to be 3 times 3 over 4. So B is going to equal 9 over 4, that little multiplying fractions thing. So to summarize over here, A equals 1, B equals 9 over 4. C equals 3 over 4, and D equals 2. So these are the coefficients. 1, 9 over 4, 3 over 4, 2, except I need to clear the fractions. My denominator is a 4, so if I multiply everything by 4, then I get uh, integer coefficients. So I can take those and plug them in. Four, eh. four, nine, three, and eight. Balanced chemical equation for the reaction of aluminum oxide and iron. A lot of students tell me that they um, like the algebraic method. They actually, a lot of students tell me that they like doing the balancing of equations in general because it's kind of like a, you know, a little math puzzle, a little logic puzzle. When you get it all figured out, it's like, yay, I'm done. Um, there's kind of a definite end reward to doing it. Um, so, but, you know, pick a method that you like. You can use either one um, and just keep working through it. And we'll do a bunch of practice and we will um, you know, with practice and habits and you kind of recognize patterns, they get easier and easier over the time. I'll give you one more algebraic example. I'll just kind of do it and you can uh, follow along and then we'll wrap it up and we'll, we'll turn to doing some discussion and some practice problems on this uh, later on in class. So here we have a reaction where uh, we would not want to use the um, polyatomic group trick that I showed you in the uh, inspection method because we have a carbonate group here. Some of that carbonate group stays together, but some of it splits apart into uh, carbon dioxide and this oxygen that's provided to water here. So this one is one where the uh, algebraic method becomes a pretty handy little trick. So if we go A, B, C, D, 
Our elements are sodium, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Sodium, I have one in A, and I have two in B. Hydrogen, I have one in A, and two in C. Uh, carbon, we've got to watch now because I have one in A, and over here I have one in B plus one in D. So really, these ones that we've been doing, this would be A equals 2B plus 0C plus 0D. Hydrogen would be 1 in A equals 0B plus 2C plus 0D. I've just been skipping the, uh, element, the substances where the, the element does not exist in that substance. So for carbon, we have 1 in A, 1 in B plus 0C plus 1 in D. So we end up with A equals B plus D. For oxygen, 3 in A, uh, 3 in B, 1 in C, and 2 in D. And you look at that and you say, oh, gee, that oxygen looks like it's going to be fun, except we end up not even needing it, um, which is the real fun. So let's start with, I'm going to go with A equals 1 again. A equals 1. If A equals 1, um, so 2B equals 1, so B equals 1 half. C, uh, A equals 2C, so if uh, 2C equals 1, C equals 1 half. So B and C are the same. And the only thing I'm missing is D. Well, I know A, I know B, so I can substitute both of those into here and get D, and then I don't actually even need to use this one. So I've been able to solve for four unknowns with three equations again um, by strategically picking one of them equal to one. I get the ratios, and then I can clear the fraction. So if uh, one equals... 1 half plus D, 1 minus 1 half equals D, 1 half equals D. So if I summarize, A equals 1, B equals 1 half, C equals 1 half, D equals 1 half. And so even though this is a fairly complicated looking equation, if I can clear, clear the fractions by multiplying by 2, the only coefficient that needs to go in, let's get it over a little bit. The only equation, uh, coefficient that needs to go in is a 2 out here in front of this. And that is using the algebraic method to balance a chemical equation. Again, uh, watch the video as many times as you need to. We'll do more examples. We'll do more practice. This is a great skill to learn. One of those things, if I look at things that... Um, Coming out of chemistry, you just need to be able to do balancing chemical equations is definitely one of them. Uh, I have confidence that you can manage it with some practice, and I'll also give you some ways to, to uh, kind of check yourself even when you've uh, done these practice problems to make sure you've done them right. I'll see you in class. Have a good day. Thanks.